Josephine Gould, who was a religious educator in the St. Lawrence District for a multitude of years. Our Gould discoursant for tonight is Priscilla Richter. Priscilla has been in this district for eight years. She also served in the Ohio Meadville District for six years, so I mean, you know, she's got all of us covered. <laughs> She uh, actually served uh, three, has served three settled ministries. The other uh, that has not yet been mentioned was in Tennessee, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, she's, she's served as a chaplain. She served as an interim minister. She has served in our districts beyond her congregation. She, for these many years in St. Lawrence, has been uh, the ministerial settlement rep. And so a multitude of congregations got to know her in that role. When she was in Ohio Meadville, she was a part, she was the program consultant and took care of organizing some of the programming, such as retreats. An important part of her ministry goes beyond her walls into whatever community where she is serving. An example she mentions is the way in which her congregation in Schenectady and other congregations in that same town banded together to serve one of the poorest neighborhoods, helping them resolve some legal issues with the city and working with them to revitalize the neighborhood. Connections and community and people have always been at the heart of what Priscilla does. Her bachelor's was in political science and she was, uh, she has a master's in social work as well as a master's in divinity. She wants me to mention in particular this one piece that leads into what she will be offering today. She writes this. Two years ago, I took a four-month sabbatical. My main project was to study the whole issue of the dramatic changes that churches and religious institutions are facing today. I was inspired by the sabbatical journeys of Reverends Wayne Arneson and Kathleen Rollens several years ago when they studied worship and did a lot of field education in religious institutions around the country. Their book, Worship That Works, an outcome of that sabbatical, has inspired many of our congregations. In that vein, on my sabbatical, she says, I visited many congregations, Unitarian Universalist, mainstream Protestant, old evangelical, young evangelical, Catholic, and house churches. I talked to many people, religious professionals and lay leaders, on my journey. This evening's Gould Discourse reflects her thinking on this important issue. She also wishes that we sing. Her, the title of her talk comes from a hymn that is in our hymnal. It actually comes prior to that hymn in the hymnal from a poem. Uh, the hymn in our hymnal, 180, 188, um, come, come, whoever you are, perhaps you're familiar with it. So one of the things that you ought to know is that this is one of Rumi's poems. Uh, Jalal Uddin Rumi um, had, wrote thousands of poems. This is the one poem that is on his tombstone. And indeed, there is a line missing in the way that we crafted it into a hymn. It's the opening line of his poem. Though you've broken your vows a thousand times, come, come, whoever you are. Wanderer, worshiper. So um, I learned that there was someone who put together a descant to be sung along with the hymn. Though you've broken your vows a thousand times, and that repeats on and on as we sing the hymn. We're going to do that right now. So any among you who wish to just have the descant, that's where it is. Uh, and so I'll start with that. We'll sing that line a couple of times, get comfortable with it, and then we'll launch into the hymn. Though you've broken your vows a thousand times, though you've broken your vows a thousand times, though you've broken your vows a thousand times, though you've broken your vows
It is such an honor and privilege to be here tonight, to be up here with two districts that I just did one of those back of the envelope calculations and two thirds of my 20 th 22 years of ministry have been in St. Lawrence and Ohio Meadville. So I feel at home. Upon my return from my sabbatical in June 2012, I read our local news that the First Presbyterian Church of Gloversville was holding its final service before it closed for good. Since I had been studying the well-documented decline of religious institutions for a couple of years with more intense study during my sabbatical, I decided to attend this service to bear witness to the tragedy of dying congregations. It was one of those perfectly beautiful June Sunday afternoons when I drove to Gloversville. First Presbyterian Church was located at one of the main intersections downtown, an imposing Gothic style church that took up a big chunk of the block. Even though I was early, I found one of the last seats in the overflow section in the back. Clearly, many more people were in attendance for that service than had been attending for the past few years. Denominational officials were present and they, along with the current minister, led the service. The organ belted out the hymns and thankfully it was not a somber affair. The message was one of hope. This is not a final death. All the good work that this church embodied for a century and a half would live on in many ways. Their faith will live on in its members who, like yeast, would leaven other congregations. A very touching part of the service was giving gifts to area congregations. A rural church was the recipient of the hymnals. Another church was gifted with the baptismal font. Kitchen stuff went to a struggling rural church. And their beloved food pantry, their pride in their community, was transferred to the neighboring United Church of Christ. The service was full of hope. But we were unmistakably present for a very sad transition, one that is repeated regularly throughout the land. It really struck me that this congregation that was founded 150 years before in the midst of the Civil War, born in a time of despair when families were sending young sons off to such a tragic war. And I thought of the hope embodied in the founding of that church, and now dying in the midst of massive cultural change. It was painful to bear witness to a phenomenon that is disconcertingly real in these times. Afterwards, I walked outside around this very large church and it was clear that quite a bit of maintenance had been deferred. And though downtown Gloversville has its attractive parts, it's clear that Gloversville had been suffering its own downturn for quite some time now. Closer to home, Two nearby congregations have suffered a similar fate this past year in neighborhoods that are not in decline. Our closest neighbor, Union Presbyterian Church, has disbanded and sold its building for a song to an African American congregation. And a Lutheran church has joined with another congregation, its building now for sale. We are in the midst of massive cultural transformation. We're in the midst of great economic dislocation. 
add in population demographic changes, generational differences, and a whole host of other factors interlacing with one another. This complex of events is affecting every institution, including religious ones. Several years ago, my inner sociologist began to study these issues in earnest. There's a whole lot written about all of this, and new stuff is coming out every day, fed by the rapid communication that the internet and social media bring. I do not put myself out here as an expert. I'm sharing with you what I found along the way. This transformation has been going on for a number of years, but the impact on religious, religious institutions has been accelerating. And sadly, it's not those other churches that are suffering, it's all of us. Mainline Protestants, Protestant churches, mega churches, evangelicals, Jewish congregations of all kinds. We Unitarian Universalists are remaining nearly flat. This past year we declined by a bit over 1%. Not bad, you say, compared to others, but we are a very small denomination. The more problematic statistic for me is that our religious education programs are taking a larger hit, declining for the past several years this past year by almost 5%. This number shows that we, like other religious institutions, are stumbling when it comes to attracting younger people. We have congregations that are thriving and growing, and so do other religious institutions. We need to understand what they are doing well to avoid decline in those that are not thriving. So I've done some statistical checking on our two districts. St. Lawrence has 35 congregations and Ohio Meadville 41. In each of our districts, almost three quarters of our congregations number under 150 members, which for a long time has been the standard threshold of a congregation's ability to fund full-time ministry. A more frightening reality is that in St. Lawrence, 40% of our congregations number under 50 members. And in Ohio Meadville, 34% are under 50 members. I have no problems with small congregations, but the margin of error is smaller for a crisis, especially if the congregation is aging and not bringing in new families. When I talk to Unitarian Universalists about this whole complex issue, I often hear denial. It's those mainstream Christian churches that are dying, not us. We're more hip and we're with it. But in many of our congregations, our worship styles and governance styles, not to mention many of our buildings, are as hidebound as many of those other churches that seem to be dying off. In other words, we need to pay attention. I, spread, I spent pretty much every week of my sabbatical visiting different types of congregations, as you heard Douglas say, you, you, and other in many different formats. One of them was a once prominent First Baptist Church that is graying and dying in a small southern town. And even though they have an outstanding minister and have long been the church in that town, they too are being affected by all of this. In the evangelical churches I attended, one attracted primarily young people, 
another was a classic megachurch, and um, another new style one that attracts people from across generational lines. And none of these were like our stereotypes of a typical evangelical church. I also spent a weekend at a conference with 500 evangelical young adults. I was one out of barely a handful that was, under, that was um, over the age of 50. I really didn't know what I was signing up for when I <laughs> signed up for that conference. But it was an amazing experience. They were committed to justice and living a larger love in the world. Some were openly gay. Most, I talk, most that I talked to were socially liberal and they welcomed me into their small groups. The world is changing. I attended small, medium, and large UU congregations, plus I spent a month at a liberal Catholic retreat center. A lot is going on out there. The religious landscape in this country is vast with seemingly endless choices. I want to share with you some of the current realities that we need to understand. One, fewer churchgoers. For many years, the percentage of Americans who regularly attend church has declined. And I'm using the word church as shorthand here. I am referring to religious institutions in general. For our younger generations, this means that many do not have experience with churches, which means that they have little reason to want to go out and seek a church, as this is outside of their experience. In the past several years, I can't tell you how many new members in their conversations with me have said, I can't believe I'm actually joining a church. <laughs> Younger generations growing up in a fast-moving technological landscape seem to be avoiding institutions in general. Their ways of connecting are more fluid and interactive. And we have a hard time taking in this new reality. We still expect our young people will be returning to us when they begin to have children. But this isn't happening. Not for us and not for other people religious institutions. For the past several decades, maybe even longer, we have worked on the model that people come to us when they are ready to look for a church. The message today is that there aren't a lot of people out there looking for church. And since people have this tendency to age and then die, not attracting younger people can be a huge problem down the line. Two, what younger generations are looking for. Now here's some better news. Younger people tend to be more liberal, open, and accepting of differences. Studies and polls have been showing that many see themselves as being spiritual and seek places that are more open to various paths. Many are seeking to live more authentically in this materialistic world. And this is indeed good news for Unitarian Universalism. The only thing is, they seem to not be seeking this in institutions. And there's this. Younger generations that do not have life experience with churches also have nothing to rebel against, <laughs> unlike many who have come through our doors in the past decades. Our openness and our core values, like standing on the side of love, are right for our times. We have the right stuff to enable people to grow <coughs> in their spiritual path in a safe and loving community. Think the bowl of our chalice containing that flame for, of spiritual growth. Three, institutions are difficult to maintain. 
They take enormous resources at a time when people don't have much money, time, or energy to put into this. Many of our buildings are beautiful but old structures that take a lot of maintenance. And some say that many congregations are one major building mishap away from demise. Indeed, it's been my experience in most of the church closings that I've seen firsthand. But institutional maintenance is more than about just the building. For many de decades, this has been a main activity of governance bodies in our churches. I remember when I was asked to become a member of the first UU congregation I attended in the early 80s. I was told that the benefits of membership were that I could vote at meetings, which seemed to only happen once a year, and join committees, which was the committee that I first wanted to join. Institutional maintenance is not what people want today in a church. Also, with new financial realities, Resources to maintain institutions are more scarce, and the outlook does not look rosy that we will at any time soon be able to return to where we were before 2008. Four, the problem with Sunday. Most of us hold our services on Sunday mornings, and if you haven't noticed, Religion has lost the battle for Sunday mornings. I'm amazed at the number of our members who have to work on Sundays. That used to be rare. Sports, clubs, arts, all kinds of events are happening on Sunday morning now. Our Schenectady Green Market, a most popular year-round venue, operates on Sunday mornings. I have to make a 50 mile round trip to go to a year round farmer's market that meets on Saturdays. Among the fewer people looking for church, there's still a lot of competition for Sunday morning. Even if it's that precious, I don't have to leave the house this morning time. Bottom line is, we expect people to enter our doors at the time that we designate. I was very pleased to hear that our professional association for religious educators, Lareda, began to address this issue at their full annual meeting. They are beginning a program called Full Week Faith knowing that to move into the future, we cannot assume that people are only interested in religious education on Sunday mornings, but need to occur at other times as well. They're looking to create opportunities for families to be engaged more than just Sundays. They're looking into Facebook groups or parenting groups or programs that involve spiritual growth for families at a time other than Sunday mornings. Five, beyond our walls. <clears throat> More people are wanting to put their faith in action beyond the walls of institutions to meet their spiritual yearnings. These include many possibilities, such as meetups in the community, and many believe that to attract people who aren't coming to our doors, we need to make connections outside of our walls rather than expecting people to come to us, finding those that some call the free-range Unitarian universes. <laughs> Going beyond our walls can also reflect new directions in how we do service or justice projects in the community, not just a fix here or there, like an occasional Saturday at a soup kitchen, but working alongside groups and individuals in the community to make a longer term difference. More on this later. So we have some tensions here. 
Unitarian Universalists have a faith that is attractive to many, but they aren't beating down our doors. We have institutions to maintain, and we're struggling in new realities to do so. Always in our congregations, the sick must be visited, the children must be taught, the rituals must be performed, and the holy must be celebrated each week. We are a faith that is based on congregational polity, which basically means if it doesn't happen in a congregation, it's not Unitarian Universalist. So we're not geared to looking beyond our walls, but now we are compelled to do so. So what can we do? All of this sounds daunting and overwhelming. My experience is that it's easier for congregations to plow ahead the way we've always done it, because it's hard to figure out how to get a handle on all of this. It's clear that no one has a road map as to what churches can do to attract the people we want to attract. We are all wandering in the unknown. All religious institutions today are like Moses' ragtag band of Israelites who, having escaped from slavery in Egypt, wandered, seemingly lost in the wilderness. But hopefully it won't take us 40 years. <laughs> I come down on the side of hope. Ours is no caravan of despair. We have a great faith that lends itself to being right for our times as it has been through several centuries. Some of the churches I visited were experimenting with new styles and activities and only time will tell what seems to be working now and what might need to be tweaked or eliminated tomorrow. A decade ago, churches thought they had the answer, do contemporary worship, which basically meant hire a rock band. <laughs> that turned out to not be the answer. They alienated their base. Many often sacrificed quality for the fact of having a rock band. Now, how many great rock bands do you know? that are wanting to be in a church early Sunday morning. <laughs> they did not achieve the results they were looking for. Now, many congregations do have a quality con con contemporary worship alongside a traditional worship, but often at non-traditional times. But more importantly, the take home is it's clear that there's no one playbook to adopt. In giving you some ideas of where to go and what to do, let me first say that in the confines of what I can do here tonight, I am not going to talk about generational differences. I'm not going to talk about governance or mission or stewardship or the importance of social media. Not to say that these aren't important, because they are. But there are lots of resources for these. I'm not going to talk about growth strategies. We have lots of small congregations, and there is nothing wrong with small churches. But small churches are going to need to find creative ways to maintain buildings and stay together as the margin of error is smaller. But on the other hand, smaller congregations can be more flexible and resilient. I give you my suggestions this evening based on my study and experience and ones that you don't need to have a lot of money that you don't have for. I'll begin with some strategies that take you beyond your walls by describing some new ventures in our UU universe. In Vancouver and some other places, congregations have begun pub theology. Meetups in pubs where contemporary issues in theology are discussed anyone can come. 
In Newark, Delaware, the minister of the UU congregation partners with a Presbyterian minister to do this. Venues other than pubs would work too. Some young seminarians and ministers in the San Francisco Bay Area have begun the Beloved Cafe, a coffee shop that is not about caffeinating the masses and making a lot of money. It's about forming a base for a community centered around our UU values. One young minister of a congregation in Houston, Texas, every Friday afternoon, sits at a table in a nearby Starbucks. She wears her clerical collar and her rainbow pin. St. Arbucks, she calls this. <laughs> Lots of young people seek her out to talk to her. What kind of minister is a woman who wears a rainbow pin? And in the greater Tulsa area, one UU minister has set up a mission in a very poor and neglected community. His church people are mainly living in that community. They've made parks, a food pantry, and are a daily presence there. Their building is more of a community center than a church. And this is what some call the missional, sir, sir, missional church, with the mission of loving the hell out of this world. Another way is to get out in your community, maybe beginning with a neighborhood, the neighborhood where your congregation is located. Now many of us are more suburban, and we assume that there are few needs there. I attended a workshop this past year at General Assembly where we were asked to get into small groups and describe the needs of our neighborhoods. So in our small group, the first person who spoke said, well, our church is in a middle class area, but a couple miles away, there, there's a neighborhood with some real needs, a poor neighborhood. The second person said essentially the same thing, and so did I. As we reconvened as a whole, the leaders asked for a report back from a couple groups. The first person at the microphone said essentially what we did in my group. But someone from the audience got up and reminded us that there are very real needs in our middle class neighborhoods. Addictions, domestic violence, financial woes, mental illness, alienated adolescents, bullying, children at home alone after school. She had a whole list. Not that one congregation could fix these issues, but the, congr the church could be that place in the neighborhood where people knew they could depend on care and the offering of support, or maybe recovery groups, or a place, say, where middle school children could come after school. You might want to invite neighbors to a dinner to get to know one another and see what common goals you might have. There may be opportunities to partner with people in your neighborhoods, and you could be more than that mysterious building in their midst. Maybe you already have partnerships with organizations in your communities. It's worth noting that our notions on how we do justice and service in our communities has shifted to a partnership model, that we partner with existing or emerging community organizations to work together on common ventures. And here's something a little different. You may encourage grassroots efforts from, your own con from within your own congregation. One congregation's board has an application process for those who want to start a new initiative. At least five people need to be on board with an application. The project needs to be well thought out, as with any grant proposal. They need to specify how much, if any, money would be needed. 
They need to show how the project is related to the church's mission. And the board vets and makes decisions on the proposals and holds accountable the groups whose proposals are accepted. They need to reapply each year with the same criteria. And this process has resulted over a few years with many projects, many in the wider community. As the great poet Rumi has said, there are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. There are a thousand ways to reach out in your communities. I now want to talk about some things that you can do within your congregations. Again, partnerships. In these times, lay leaders, clergy, and staff need to be working together in partnership to serve your congregation's mission. This is not a competition with different parts of the organization, and this is a shared ministry that works. Partnership also works between and among congregations. Many of us have moved or are moving into geographic clusters, finding ways to work together. The Lone Ranger congregation is a relic of the past. We need to partner with our neighboring UU congregations, working together on outreach to those who might be interested in our congregations, coming together to work in the larger community, and to share some of our resources and expertise with one another. Our congregations in the capital region of New York croony, if you will. We've worked together now for almost a decade. Presidents and ministers gather once a month. Annually, we have a very popular joint worship. We've done service projects together. We advertise on public radio, and we have bonded in so many important ways. Our congregations have been strengthened tremendously by our work together. I move on now to a sensitive issue. How accepting are we really in our congregations? Mainly, I want to address how we accept or not different spiritual paths. We seriously need to let go of our tensions around our various theologies. Theists or Christians or pagans versus humanists or atheists or agnostics, etc. These old arguments not only go against the increasing tide of pluralism, multiculturalism, and a broadening social acceptance of differences, particularly among young people today. But more important, they go against our own deeply held principles. Unitarian Universalists are the, first, the ones who first built religious tolerance into the very fabric of who we are. I experienced one of those deeply transformative moments this past summer in Transylvania as several of us embarked on the Unitarian History Tour and a visit to our partner church. On the outskirts of Deva, we had just taken a funicular up the steep mountainside to the top where the castle ruins and fortress prison lie the very prison where Ferenc David died. David, of course, was a reformer who brought not only Unitarian theology to transformation to Transylvania, now part of Romania, but through his efforts with the young king, John Sigismund, in 1568, the Edict of Torda was passed 
bringing religio religious tolerance to the country. And this was the first edict that gave people the right to practice the religion of their choice rather than being coerced into practicing the religion of their ruler. The young king died tragically, and David was imprisoned and later died there. Although the prison area was not open to the public, our Unitarian tour leader had a key to the padlock. So I went back, and standing in that very cell where David was imprisoned and died, windowless and dank and claustrophobic. The power of our centuries-old commitment to religious tolerance was palpable. I was overwhelmed. And at a much deeper level, I understood the huge need to stand up for religious tolerance. We still live in a world where different religious beliefs our fodder for terror and war. And it kills me to hear a lack of tolerance in our own congregations. It's way past time to put to rest our old theist, humanist arguments or variants thereof. For we are both, we are many, we are one. Our forebears died for this. It is our imperative to find ways to embrace this kind of radical acceptance in our congregations in the spirit of love. Younger generations, especially those who didn't grow up in a church environment, don't understand our tensions around spirituality and theological difference. And yes, this is hard. It's been going on for over a hundred years now because there's something in human nature that wants people around us reflecting our own beliefs. But we are called to something more. Now I want to talk about resilience. When I returned from my sabbatical and was gushing to some of my colleagues about what I found from my study and field work, one asked me this question. What is the one main thing that our congregations need? What would turn the tide? My one word answer was resilience. This colleague did a polite variation of rolling the eyeballs. She was expecting, I believe, a formula, a program, a technical fix, which nobody has found yet. So what do I mean when I say we need resilience? It means being in the flow, sensing when the flow is changing and requiring something more of us, and not being afraid to move into the flow. Resilience is when you've broken your vow of vows a thousand times and you pick yourself up and bring yourself back to where you what you feel you must do to move forward. We need to be comfortable with making mistakes and learning from them. Resilience requires the kind of community that we dream of one that is open and loving with one another and forgiving, ready to meet the challenges with the strength of one another. In other words, being that resilient, interdependent web that knows that it is never fixed, never static, and never has all the answers. It evolves in the spirit of love and hope. It lives the great principles at the core of our UU faith. It knows that right now we are all caterpillars moving into the cocoon, knowing that something is drastically about to change, 
We are scared, not knowing that we will eventually become butterflies. <laughs> we need the resilience of all that requires. And we need to be reminded that we are the bearers of a resilient faith that has survived many great challenges to our religion. For instance, when Darwin shook the world with his theories of evolution and natural selection, we rolled with the punches and found ways for our faith to include new truths. That is one of our core values, that new truth is always dawning on some horizon. Our faith is a resilient one, not adapting to every new trend, but in discerning what new truths and new changes might mean as we bring our principles forward to meet the day. We are facing that time when new truth is not only dawning, but it is full sun in our faces. We need to practice resilience because as we move forward, as we bring on new ways of being church, we will have failures. We will find way, some ways that won't work. And moving forward from this to evaluate what was not working, what we learned from it, and what we might need to try in the future, this is resilience in practice. Lastly, and maybe most important, be passionate about your UU faith and your congregation. The congregations that I visited that were most exciting to me were the ones that embodied this kind of passion. It was like an electric current that flowed through their space and worship. Hospitality was remarkable in these places from the moment I entered the parking lot to the time I departed. It did not feel like a show or that someone was following some scripted five steps to welcoming a visitor. It felt like a genuine sharing of their love, of their faith and congregation, and not only by the people who staff the visitor table. So cultivate your passion. How do you articulate what Unitarian Universalism means to you? What do you love most about your congregation? How has your life been transformed by being a part of Unitarian Universalism? Everyone has a story, and many are salvific. We have that kind of faith that changes lives. But, you know, in some of our congregations, one would never know this first walking in that door. One word of caution about that. This is not the same as pouncing on newcomers and regaling them with tales of your wonderfulness. That Southern Baptist church that was graying and dying that I visited, they were so delighted to have a <coughs> younger visitor <laughs> that after the service, they pounced on me like goldfish on fish food. This was not passion. This was desperation. <laughs> know the difference. <laughs> so I've brought forth some common themes here. The need to reach out to people who are out there who want and need what we have. And going beyond our walls. And also while we do the work of maintaining our institutions because we need both. Another common theme is partnership out in the community, among ourselves, and with other UU congregations. We need resilience and passion. We are no caravan of despair. We have a faith that has evolved through the centuries, through centuries of massive change, and our principles and purposes reflect timeless values that can withstand any storm. Our core message of love and hope, of acceptance and freedom and justice is transformational that, and that's so needed in this world. 
We are people of hope, but not if we sit back and do nothing. We need to ask and address with one another what vital possibilities exist in this exciting and chaotic time. How can we reframe our ministries? How can we strengthen our communities to live out our faith? May we move boldly into the unknown, knowing deep in our hearts that we have the faith and the strength and the love that will see us through.